Nobody's just, just, super different. Super different. Well, Lions, you're the one guy who's really, really unique and incredible. Uh, uh, forum for the storytellers art. I mean, most storytelling today is Spielberg, and you need to have seventy million dollars, or you can't get it produced. And storytelling as an oral tradition is one of the priceless, priceless uh, human communications from the earliest days of the Neanderthals and the and the, the Cro-Magnon sitting around the fire at night. Uh, storytelling has been the great enchanted medium for sparking the human imagination. And you have had this brilliant idea of bringing, let me say this, bringing storytellers together in this fashion. If, if, if you say, storytelling tonight, and we're going to have eight storytellers, you're lucky if you get eight people in the audience. But by putting it in the context where the storytellers get this sort of uh, friendly competition, it brings out the audience, and the audience brings out the best of the storytellers. And it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, method of keeping alive the ancient art of, uh, of oral histories and uh, the storyteller's art. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for doing this for us. Okay. Thank you for doing this again. Mr. Okay. Beck, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you? Yes, I do. And so saying that, I was testifying on behalf of my friend Arnie Jarrett as a character witness, the Southern District of New York, in 19, must have been spring of 1987. Arnie, whom I'd known since I was 12, had been busted at a club in New York for selling ecstasy pills to some narc, and he was, it was, it was a, a fairly well publicized trial because Arnie was the first, it was, it was, this was New York's first ecstasy bust, and there had been all this press, all this stuff, California, this, that, yuppie drug of choice, all this kind of upscale thing, it wasn't a street scene with drive-by shootings, and so it was kind of, it was kind of like a safe zone for druggies to inhabit for a while, as many of us remember. And Arnie had got popped in this club selling apparently 30 hits of this to a narcotics agent and the press was in the courtroom and so on and so forth. And they'd, as a, they'd, they'd talked to me, he and his lawyer, about testifying on his behalf. I was a small business owner and they said, look, uh, you, you don't have any experience with this drug? I said, no, I don't. I've never had it. I hadn't taken it. I don't know anything about it. I know Arnie. I know his family business. I know, uh, I know, I know him since we're kids. I'm happy to be just a character witness. So we go there early in the morning, and the prosecution makes its case, and their, their lab guy comes forward, and their narc guy comes forward, and they do the whole uh, prosecution business. And, and uh, Arnie comes forward, and he testifies that he never saw this, and he never met this guy, and he don't know anything about this, and how this could have happened to him. It's a mix-up. Uh, that's, his, that's his pitch. And I come up to testify, and I talk about how, he, how I've known him since he was 12. And they pre they've prepped me. They've prepped me. And I'm talking about how he's got a modest furniture business, how he's never had any big box, how he comes down and visits me periodically in the city, he doesn't have flashy clothes, he doesn't drive a flashy car, how he's an all-around good, hard-working guy. I talk about his woodworking shop in, in uh, upstate New York outside of Peekskill, and how he, uh, how he uh, hand tools on lathe, uh, Reproductions of old uh, antique furniture, four poster beds, that kind of thing. How he's, you know, I'm, I'm pitching him as just a hard working, good guy who is some, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not asked any questions about uh, what I know about uh, other business of his because I don't know anything about other business of his. And he's, I see the, you know, the reporters in the back are writing stuff down and this, uh, they ask the, the, uh, the defense attorney asks me, uh, have you ever taken any ecstasy? I say no. Have you ever seen any ecstasy? I say no. Do you know anything about it? Have you ever, has Arnie ever talked to you about this? I say no. Very good. Uh, your witness. Prosecutor comes over, and he goes over some of the same ground. He asks me what kind of cars Arnie has. And I say, well, he's got a nice, you know, nice truck, 
big old box truck where he brings the furniture down to the antique reproduction stores or custom orders. He brings it into the city in his truck. What kind of car does he drive? Well, he drives an old Volvo. Well, not exactly old, old, one of those round body types. It's his, it's his sedan. And, uh, have I ever seen him? Uh, they, they, the prosecutor wants to know if he buys jewelry from me. And I say, well, you know, I'm in the jewelry business. I've represented that already. Well, he, you know, maybe a turquoise pendant, that kind of thing, a little trinket, but no, he's never bought gemstones or anything of the sort. Then the prosecutor <coughs> says, Mr. Beck, do you smoke marijuana? And it's like coming from left field, and I look at the judge, like I'm not on trial here, I look at the judge, uh, like am I supposed to, uh, her honor, the judge is a lady, she says, um, oh, our, the, our lawyer, Arnie's lawyer stands up and objects, and the judge says, well, you did ask him whether he had ever seen or used ecstasy, and in that line, in that line of questioning, I'm going to allow this question. And it's one of these very short moments. It didn't take me long to answer. But it was one of those moments that sort of expanded itself. And I'm thinking about last night in my apartment, sitting on a futon with Arnie, smoking a big bomber, talking about how we're going to deal with this case. And, and I'm thinking this over. It turns out the, the matters of the hand, I'm thinking... You know? Even this morning when I got up with my roommate, before he went off to work and I went off to work, we finished off that, that little road charoo that was left. We thought about that. It seemed like a long time ago. A whole day. And I turned, not answering the prosecutor, but answering her honor. I said, you, you know, Your Honor, I, I have, but it's a awfully, awfully long time ago. <laughs> the prosecutor said, no further questions. <laughs> and that's really the essence of the story. Let me conclude, though, just so I don't leave you hanging, that what happened was when Arnie was on the stand and he looked at the baggie with the, the 30 capsules in it, Arnie, during one of the recesses, said to the lawyer, listen, I know what that stuff looks like. Good X is kind of tan color, beigey color. And what was in those caps was bright white. Something's wrong here. So, actually, even before I testified, our lawyer had asked, our lawyer, Arnie's lawyer, had asked that these capsules, at least one of them at random, be retested that day, then and there. And the judge said, well, fine by us. Pick one out, boom, and away it went. And shortly after I was done testifying, <laughs> The guy from the crime lab came back and said, Your Honor, you know, da, 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 the report, this is phenobarbital. <coughs> and as Arnie later said, hey, those guys in the lab or wherever, they found out that this was uh, the really good stuff. <laughs> and they kept it for themselves, swapped it for other similar looking illegal caps that they had in the chest through the drawers of this, the whatever. The uh, New York Times ran nothing on it. The Daily News said, a Judge orders investigation of crime lab. And the Post, oh, they're wonderful. The Post ran, and I, I don't know if I have it exactly right, but the Post ran the caption, uh, the headline caption, as Judge asks why, why, the letter Y, there's no X. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for all the storytellers.